good to see such a wonderful group of folks out this morning, have the opportunity to worship our God, to study together from the Bible. One problem that has existed perhaps throughout time has been a lack of Bible knowledge. We find this was a problem in the Old Testament times. We find that it is still a problem. Sadly, many today don't have a good working knowledge of a history of the church, the uniqueness of the church, the New Testament teaching concerning the pattern itself, how the church should be organized, how it should worship, how one becomes a New Testament Christian. Sadly, there are some who have grown up attending in the church throughout many years and still they cannot give book, chapter, and verse for why we worship as we do or even how one becomes a Christian according to the pages of the New Testament. There are many reasons perhaps for such ignorance. But this morning I would like to begin a loose loosely fit series of lessons, not on one subject, but under the topic or heading of first principles. Some very basic studies, some of which we have studied in Bible class or preached upon. Some of the things will certainly not be new, but we need to spend time. We need to know why we do the things that we do. We need to understand our worship, and especially the uniqueness of the church for which Jesus gave himself. We need to realize that every generation needs to be taught, and these facts from the Bible need to be passed on. What a good opportunity to take notes, to investigate further, especially if you're not a New Testament Christian, the church that we read about in the pages of the New Testament. I'm going to use PowerPoint this morning. My presentation is not what I had wanted. I have no excuse other than just perhaps ignorance and uh, myself, but hopefully the passages that we'll be using, the things will be useful in our study. As we think about the beginning of the church, we need to realize, first of all, that we're talking about the church in the New Testament. There are many religious groups today calling themselves the church and the question often arises, but how do we know which church is right? People have asked me that many times in studying the Bible. How can we know? Well, we certainly can know. God has not left us in the dark. We understand that God is a loving God. God desires what is best for us. And God has given us the Bible in order to tell us how to live, how to serve Him, how to worship, how to please Him so that we might be with Him forever in that heavenly home. So if we are concerned about the beginning of the church, we find that we go to the pages of the New Testament and we find that the church that Jesus established began in the city of Jerusalem. It began on the day of Pentecost following His ascension back into heaven. Now just to get a, a time frame, we understand that roughly 40 to 50 days have passed since His death, burial, and resurrection. He spent that period of time, a little over a month to a month and a half, in preparing and giving last minute instructions and perhaps one of the most important things he did was he showed himself alive not only to the apostles but to many others there in and around the city of Jerusalem. So now Jesus has ascended back into heaven. Now what was going to take place with the beginning with the establishment of the church it can be found recorded in Acts the second chapter. But these things did not just happen accidentally. The beginning of the church was not something that was an afterthought on the part of God, but instead we find these things had 
been prophesied time and again. And I just want to notice a couple of passages. Isaiah chapter 2, for example, verses 2 and 3. Here the prophet said, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come, let us go into the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now a parallel passage to this is found in Micah chapter 4. And if you'll notice, the wording is very, very similar in verses 1 and 2. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it and many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob and He will teach us His ways and we will walk in His paths for the law shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now there are a couple of expressions here the house of the Lord, and the house of the God of Jacob. Both of these expressions refer to the church that Jesus was about to build. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, notice the expression here referring to the church. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of and ground of the truth. Now this particular phrase, the house of, is used on a number of occasions to refer to the church, just as it is here. Now the events of Acts chapter 2 were in fulfillment of a promise that Jesus Himself had made. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, we find that Jesus had asked the question to His apostles, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, why, some say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus then turned to the apostles themselves and he said, but who do you say that I am? And if you recall, it was Peter who said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus pronounced a blessing upon Simon. And he went on to say, as recorded in verse 18, upon this rock, upon the confession of faith, Peter, that you have made, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now from this passage I would have you notice Jesus said He would build His possessive church. Whose church would He build? His. When we use the term church of Christ we're not using a denominational name, but we are identifying ownership. The church of which we are a part is not the church of David. It's Christ. He purchased it, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, with His own blood. He promised He would build His church. And also, before we leave this, I would suggest Jesus said, I will build my church. And He used the word singular here. Singular, one, I will build my church. Not many churches. He goes on to say the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That also is singular, not plural, not many. So Jesus promised he would build his church, which he did. And the church of Christ, his church, as it was planned by God from the beginning, is complete in every way. You see, Jesus Christ is identified as the head of the church. 